Good morning. And if you are joining us online, good morning to you. We're in Romans 12 in the middle of our BRP summer series. That's the Bible reading plan. And this week, if you're following along with us, you will be reading in Romans chapter 12. And that's where we're going to focus our attention today. I want to start it with a story uh, about a a farmer in Indiana and a grass fire broke out uh, on his property. And it was pretty bad. It was threatening uh, everything that he owned. And uh, so he called the fire department. They came out. And it didn't take long for them to realize this is bigger. It's more than we can handle. And, uh, and so they started looking at what other fire department can we call them. There was a volunteer fire department, but there was a debate among the firemen. Will they be any good? Are they equipped enough to help us? You know, are they going to be more of a hindrance than they are help? But it, the fire was getting out of hand so quickly, they decided to go ahead and call this volunteer fire department. They, they called him, and, and, and just in a few minutes, here come this truck flying. I mean, just absolutely flying down the road. And it was a little bit older because of volunteer and a couple of guys hanging off of it. And as they got near the fire, they didn't even slow down. Just kept going, and he drove into the fire, right, into it, into the middle of fire. And then guys just jumped off that truck every direction, grabbed hoses, and they put the fire out from the middle of the fire. And the farmer was like, you saved my farm. So grateful to them for, for what they had done. And, and you guys, how can I ever repay you? And he took his checkbook out, and he, he wrote a check for $1,000, and it uh, didn't take long for the papers and stuff to start hearing about it. And uh, paper came out to interview the, uh, the captain of the fire, the volunteer fire department. He said, listen, man, what a great thing you did. What are you going to do with the $1,000 the farmer gave you? He said, well, first thing we're going to do is fix the brakes on that truck. <laughs> <laughs> so my question for you is this. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of a fire and wished you'd put the brakes on? Hmm. Yeah, most of us have. Um, more often than not, that looks like some kind of conflict, some kind of confrontation, or some kind of fight that we find ourselves in the middle of. And that's what we're going to be talking about today out of Romans 12, one of the greatest struggles in the lives of, of those who've made the choice to follow Jesus. So if you will, read with me uh, Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another, and do not be haughty in your mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. This is going to be a long message. Um, Respect what is right in the sight of all men, if possible, so far as it depends on you. Be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For his written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. And this is what we've titled this message today. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Are you overcoming evil or is evil overcoming you? I want to tell you this to start the message so you know where it's coming from. When I started the doctoral program working on my degree, I took the Minnesota Multifacic Personality uh, Test. And the group of guys that went in with me, I had pegged the Minnesota multiphasic on, it, on anger. And I was proud of it. I'm the angriest guy in the room. Somewhere in all of my seminary education, no one had pointed out to me that James tells us that the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. <laughs> and that is the perspective from which I want to share with you today from an angry man who constantly fights not being overcome by evil. Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for our time together. I I pray that you'd teach us and speak to us. And and God, uh, open our eyes to those areas of life where really honestly we think we're doing better than we are. And and Father, help us to, to be able to come to terms with how great your grace is and what an opportunity it is to walk with you. Thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, five, five truths from these verses, these seven verses, uh, to help us understand what we do with conflict and anger in our lives. Number one, we should replace our natural reactions with supernatural reactions. This is kind of everything that Paul is saying is that we get a choice in life whether we're going to react naturally or whether we're going to choose to act like a follower of Jesus. And we're built with all these natural reactions. And a natural reaction is what you do without having to think about it. 
So if something comes flying at your face, your eyes will close. You will blink. That's a natural reaction built into you by God to protect your eye, right? You don't want anything to happen to them. God put that there. If someone throws something at you, you don't go through the mental process of going, what am I going to do with that object flying at me? You either put your hands up to catch it or you get out of the way of it. You don't even have to think about that. If someone tries to hit you, you try to avoid it. These are natural reactions. Well, there are certain natural reactions we have when someone offends us. Look right up here at me and hear this. Or hurts us, or we feel like we've experienced an injustice in life. And what Paul is saying is if you're going to follow Jesus, you have to replace natural reactions with supernatural reactions. You can't do what you're naturally wired to do. So let, let's look at that for a second and see if we can come to an understanding of it. If you, if you're at the office, if you're at home and people are joking around and all of a sudden you become the object of the joke, can you laugh along with people or do you feel like, oh, I got to have a comeback? I'm not going to let them get the best of me. Wait till you see the bomb I'm going to drop on them. Right? Take it up a level. Let's go home. And it's husband and wife. And right, maybe there's an attitude that you think, well, that attitude, that was a little sharp. That was a little cutting. Those phrases were a little cutting. And maybe they didn't, weren't meant to be, but you interpret them. And you come right back. And you come back hard rather than just going, okay, that's okay. I understand. There may be something behind that. Well, you might be letting natural reactions supersede supernatural reactions. Now here, listen, listen, listen. This, is, this is the kicker to this. What you are in the lesser is what you will be in the greater. If you can't keep your mouth shut when somebody's making a joke, you put yourself in the greater conflict, you're going to make a mess. What we are in the lesser is what we truly are and what we will be in the greater. There are a few places in Scripture where uh, the natural reaction is superseded by the supernatural reaction. One is in 1 Samuel 24, the story of David. Um, we're going to talk about David and Stephen and Jesus today, all of whom received injustices that are far greater than any injustice you ever received. Level the playing field. I don't care what's happened to you. I've had conversations with people this morning, been sexually abused, family problems. Whatever you've been through, what they went through is far, far bigger than what we're going through. So what was David's? I will attempt to kill you multiple times. Multiple times. Throw spears at you. Bring armies after you. I'm going, I'm going to grind you into the dust. And that was Saul. And that was his attitude toward David. So much so that David ends up running for his life and living in a cave. All the other people who were running for their lives, they hear about David. They go live in the cave with him. They ultimately become some of David's mighty men. Well, David's living in this cave, and Saul's out with his army looking for him. And the Bible is such a funny book, if you'll let it be funny and cannot be like so spiritual. God says, uh, Saul, I think you need to go to the bathroom. And Saul goes, ooh, I need to go to the bathroom. Where can I go privately to the bathroom? Oh, there's a cave over there. And he looks at his men, and he says, look, I don't want you guys hanging around. While I go to the bathroom, I'm going to go up to that cave. I'm going to go to the bathroom. Now, listen, there is never a more vulnerable time in all of your life than when you're going to the bathroom. <laughs> right? So there's Saul going to the bathroom. And lo and behold, he chose the cave David was living in, along with all of his men. And his men lose their mind. Right? David, this is the moment God told you about that he will give your enemies into your hand. He did it. Look, go kill him. And that's what they said. Go kill him. David, he's conflicted a little bit, but he's like, too good a moment to pass up. So he sneaks up behind Saul while Saul's going to the bathroom, and he cuts off part of his ropes. As soon as he did it, his conscience bothered him. His conscience bothered him. Saul gets up and goes out of the cave, and I'm going to read to you now 1 Samuel 24. Uh, what, what happened after that moment? Now afterward, David arose, and he went out of the cave, and he called after Saul, saying, My lord, the king... And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the ground and prostrated himself. I need you to get this, that the man who, was, who incurred the wrong, who incurred the injustice, 
He's the man who's humbled himself and is on the ground. In all of our minds, it should be Saul. Saul deserved that moment, but it's David. And then he goes on to say this. David said, why do you listen to the words of men saying, behold, David seeks to harm you. Behold, this day your eyes have seen that the Lord had given you today into my hand in the cave. And some said, I should kill you, but my eye had pity on you. And I said, I will not stretch out my hand against the Lord's, for he is the Lord's anointed. Now my father, I love the fact that he called him father, and Saul will call him son before it's over. I indeed see the edge of your robe in my hand, for I have cut off the edge of your robe and did not kill you. No one perceived that there's no evil or rebellion in my hands, and I have not sinned against you, though you are lying in wait for my life to take it. May the Lord judge between you and me. May the Lord avenge me on you. But my hand shall not be against you. As the proverb of the ancient says, out of the wicked comes forth wickedness. Okay, here's what I need you to see. If you are a seething pot of anger, wickedness is the root of it. That the wrath of man cannot work the righteousness of God. That anger will overcome you with evil unless you overcome it with good. That's all David's saying. As a matter of fact, this whole story is an illustration of Romans 12. But look what happens. And after the king has come out of Israel, who are you pursuing? A dog, a dead dog, a single flea? The Lord therefore be judge and decide between you and me. And may he see and plead my cause and deliver me from your hand. And when David had finished saying these words to Saul, Saul said, Is that your voice, my son David? And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. And he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have dealt well with me, and I have dealt wickedly with you. Okay, I want you to see what happens. When we pursue natural reactions, something dies. Look at me. I haven't said this in any other service. When we pursue natural reactions, something's going to die. It may be your marriage. It may die. It may be your relationship with your kids. It may die. It may be a friendship. It may be a church. It doesn't have to be a physical death. I'm promising you, when evil overcomes goodness in your life because of anger, something is going to die. And that's what all the men wanted, kill him. But when we live with supernatural goals as a follower of Jesus, watch this. We bring life to a situation. Look at what happened to Saul. He looked at David and said, man, I see that the distance between where I am with God and where you are with God has convicted me. Thank you, David. Thank you, my son. So we decide, do we overcome evil with good? Or do we allow our lives to be overcome by evil? Number two, we attempt to understand life experiences of our enemies. Um, I want to I share a story with you about a fifth grade teacher named Jean Thompson. Uh, it was the very first day of school, and, and she lied to her class. She told them, like most teachers, that she loved them all the same and she would treat them all the same, but that was not going to be possible because there in the front of her class, in the third row, in a seat, was a little boy named Teddy Stoddard. And Miss Thompson had watched Teddy the year before and noticed that he didn't play well with other children, that his clothes were unkept, and he always needed a bath. He was just unpleasant. It got to the point during the first few months that she had actually take delight in marking his papers with a broad red pen, making bold X's and then putting an F at the top so everyone could see it. And because Teddy was a sullen boy, no one seemed to care because they didn't enjoy him either. At the school where Miss Thompson taught, she was required to review each child's records and put Teddy's off until the last. When she opened his file, she got a surprise. His first grade teacher had written, Teddy's a bright, inquisitive child with a ready laugh. He does his work neatly. He has good manners. He's a joy to be around. The second grade teacher wrote, he's an excellent student, well liked by his classmate. He has, uh, he's troubled because his mother has a terminal illness and life at home is, has become a struggle. Third grade teacher wrote, Teddy continues to work hard, but his mother's death has been hard on him. He tries to do his best, but his father doesn't show much, in, much interest in him, and his home life will soon affect him if steps aren't taken. Teddy's fourth grade teacher wrote, Teddy is withdrawn. He doesn't show much interest in school. He doesn't have many friends and sometimes sleeps in class. He's tardy. He will become a problem. 
By now, Miss Thompson realized the problem, but Christmas was coming fast. It was all she could do to keep up with the school play until the day before the holidays began, and suddenly she was forced to focus on Teddy Stoddard. Her children began to bring presents into the room, and they were all uh, covered in bright, beautiful ribbon and paper, except for Teddy's, which was clumsily wrapped in heavy brown paper scissored out of a grocery bag. Miss Thompson took pains to open it in the middle of the other presents. Some of the children started to laugh when she opened it, and she found a rhinestone bracelet, and some of the stones were gone out of it. In addition, there was a, a bottle of cologne, and it was only about a quarter full. She stifled the children's laughter when she exclaimed how pretty the bracelet was, and she put it on, and she opened the cologne and dabbed a little bit on her other wrist. That day, Teddy Stoddard stayed behind just long enough to say, Miss Thompson, today you smell just like my mom used to smell. And I tell you that story so that we can walk out of here and realize this truth. Behind every reaction, there's a story. Here's what Paul said. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Here's what he's saying. Know what's going on in somebody's life. Right before you engage in this conflict, ask the question, what happened? What happened here? Before you get offended, try to understand the person. And here's what happens when we begin to understand someone's history, someone's life experiences. More often than not, what we feel is compassion and not confrontation. Third truth. Don't be concerned with what others deserve, but what we are required. Verse 17. Never anywhere in Scripture does Scripture tell us to be concerned with what someone else deserves. The teaching of Scripture is about what is required of me. How do I now live? Watch this. Listen carefully to this. It does not matter how others treat us. Our standard for living as a follower of Jesus never changes. So I'm going to phrase it to you this way. Someone else's sin is not an excuse for our sin. Are you with me? Well, it doesn't matter what your wife did. It doesn't matter what your husband did. It doesn't matter what your friend did. Someone else's behavior is not an excuse for our sin. All this really shows up when we start giving. Um, Again, I, I, I would say, based on my life, if you have anger issues, this is probably going to be true of you. Uh, we get into the what do people deserve category, right, rather than what I'm required to do. And so uh, someone, let's say someone has a need, and you're going to help them with that need. They can't pay a bill. And you sit down, you talk with your mate, and you go, hey, let's give them 100 bucks, help them pay, help them pay out their, meal, uh, their bill. And, and later that day, you go out and eat, and lo and behold, guess who's there spending your $100? To go out and eat. And you look at your wife and you say, oh, man, look at your husband and go, oh, hey, look at that. They didn't deserve that, how they used that. I'll never give anything to them again. Well, you just moved into what people deserve category and not what's required of you. Are you with me? So let me help you with that just a little bit. I need you to answer this out loud. Did you deserve what Jesus gave you? Okay, that, was, that wasn't everybody. Um, did you deserve what Jesus gave you? No. Now, now, this is the big one. Because, you know, we all realize that. Have you abused it since he gave it to you? Yes. Aren't you glad he's not in the what do you deserve business? And listen, here's our goal. We don't give to control. We don't give to get. We give to be like Jesus. Are you following me? That's called freedom if you are not familiar with it. I give it. I take my hands off of it. It's yours. You can do whatever you want because you know what? That's how God treats me. That's what he did with me. Paul says it plainly in verse 17. He says, do not repay any man evil for evil. There is no conditional clauses in that anywhere. Pay no man evil for evil unless he really hurts your feelings. Pay no man evil for evil unless he says something really bad. Pay no, repay no man evil for evil unless your kid didn't get to play on the starting team. Are you with me? I don't think you're with me. Right? That no one in no circumstances, it doesn't matter what they are, is ever repaid evil for evil by a follower of Jesus. That, that's horribly hard. That's unreal. 
that we would be able to go through life and not repay evil. Can you imagine such a walk with God that what someone did to you no longer mattered? That it just didn't matter anymore. That you could leave it to God and let God handle it. Which brings us to the next point. This is verse 18. Seek peace, not victory. Whoo! In the competitive world we live in, seek peace, not victory. So I got a question. This is a fun question. This might be the most fun question we've had all morning. Had you rather suffer evil than do evil? You got a choice. You're going to suffer evil or you're going to do evil. Well, I believe most people would rather do evil. When push comes to shove, then suffer evil. Now, there are going to be a couple people out there who go, Pastor, I'd rather suffer evil than ever do evil. We're going to help you get some clarity on that in just a second. <laughs> um, of how much you really, really desire to suffer evil. There are two, two really good scriptural illustrations. Uh, Acts 7, Stephen is being stoned. Get this again, nobody's stoning you. Big rocks hurled at him. And he looks up at heaven and he says, uh, Don't hold this against them, Father. And I'm just going to guess if you can't laugh off a cutting comment, when we get into the bigger issues that really hurt, you're never going to be able to look at God and say, Would you forgive them? The second one's Jesus, who in the midst of his crucifixion said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Do you, do you know that Jesus, before this, said this? He said, I called 12 legions of angels if I need to. Well, you needed to, right? Because if it had been me, 12 legions are on their way, right? It, the first time you spit on me, send them. <laughs> are you with me? Is that we, our anger is triggered. We're living the most angry generation that's ever existed. It takes nothing to set us off. Nothing. So what, what's 12 legions? An overwhelming army is what the Bible says. Just a number so big that it just comes in and wipes out everything. And you're in this process of being crucified. And the Bible actually says Jesus didn't look like a human being. They beat him so badly. And never, he had the power and he never used it. So if someone cuts you off in traffic and you speed around them to cut them off, you had rather do evil than suffer evil. You getting some clarity? If you feel the need to balance the scales when someone makes a cutting remark, you'd rather do evil than suffer evil. And if you and I had rather do evil than suffer evil in the small things, then we'd rather do evil than suffer evil in the big things. And because you and I are sitting in a church pew, look right up here at me, does not mean that our hearts are not filled with evil. Because I read this stuff and I realize how far I am, how far I am from what God wants me to be. Paul, in verse 18, says, and he phrases this in such a way that there may come a time in life when principle trumps peace. That's pretty rare. It's pretty rare. Matthew preached a few weeks back. The more often than not, what it comes down to is personality or possessions or personal preferences is what we really fight about. James says it this way. We fight because we're consumed with lust, desire. So we quarrel and fight with each other. And in so doing, we soil the name of Jesus. Last point, we're done. Overwhelming love will eventually become, or over, overcoming love, overwhelming love will eventually become overcoming love. Um, this is how we live our life as a follower of Jesus. And, and what the scripture tells us is we have to get to the place where we trust God to win the battles of life. That he's going to balance the scales. That he will exact vengeance where vengeance truly needs to be exacted. And, and we are to trust that. Can you imagine what the world would be like if we did? 
how our enemies would respond if we left it to God, how our children would live differently because they saw us live differently. He said, well, pastor, what do I do? Because here's the truth. Most of us have been hurt, right? There's nobody in this room that hadn't been hurt, just varying degrees of hurt. And sometimes that hurt is so big, it becomes overwhelming anger. And overwhelming anger will become overwhelming evil. Just stay with me. So what do I do, pastor? Because I'm tired of living angry. I'm tired of being mad all the time. So I want that question for you again. In the life of Jesus, because that's a good place to get an answer to a question like this. Who was his arch nemesis, his arch enemy in all of life? Don't say the devil because that's a spiritual thing. And on this earth, who was his number one enemy that did they, their very best to hurt him? Who was it? Pharisees. Scribes and Pharisees. They lied about him, tried to set him up, tried to do everything they possibly could, and ultimately uh, plotted to kill him and carried that plot out. And so what do you do? By the way, I'm going to remind you, you don't have an enemy that bad. Nobody in here has got an enemy that bad. So what did Jesus do with his enemies? Because I got a philosophy of what I do with my enemies. You do too. Right? When it's really bad because I'm a pastor, I can't do what I'd really like to do sometimes. I create distance. I cut you out of my life. Just cut you out of my life. You cease to exist for me. It's an easier life, right, than worrying that you're going to say something to make me mad again. I just don't want to be around you anymore. And that works pretty well in my life till we read things like this. <laughs> and all of a sudden you're like, that's not Jesus. I had a lady come down last service at the end of service. Adopted into a home and abused severely. And she said, I've never heard anybody else say they had the cut it out of my life philosophy, but I cut them all out of my life. And said, then I started cutting everything out and I finally came home. She said, this is my home and I finally come back to make it all right. Would you pray with me? No, 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 not you. She asked me that. <laughs> Man, that scared me. It's like, what happened? Everybody went, boom. <laughs> Dead gum. <laughs> she asked me to pray with her. <laughs> Whew, now I'm sweating. Y'all scared me, man. <sighs> I was like, ah. So what do we do? So, so Jesus, his, his arch nemesis, I want to show you this and we're done. He ate a meal with them. Never in all my life have I asked this question. Three times in the Gospel of Luke, three separate times, Jesus went into the home of the people who were trying to kill him. And he sat down with them and he broke bread. Luke chapter 7, it was Simon the Pharisee. And the woman came in and she washed his feet with her tears. And Jesus looked at him and he said, Simon, do you understand what she's doing? That people who are forgiven much, love much. And Simon, I need you to hear this because you think you're close to God, but you're not. The people who are forgiven love little, Simon. He went into the home of his enemy so his enemy could grow spiritually, so that his enemy could really begin to know God. Luke chapter 11, a Pharisee comes to Jesus after he was done teaching and said, can we have lunch together? If you had told me there was a place in the Bible that somebody said, Jesus, you want to do lunch, I would have told you, you've lost your mind. It's there. And the scripture says, Jesus went and reclined at a table with him and broke bread. The guys who are trying to do so much to him. Luke chapter 14, the leader of the Pharisees. All right, now we done up the game, right? On the Sabbath, we really have upped it because this is my day of worship. It's also your day of worship. You just don't realize how far from God you are. So I'll have lunch with you in hopes that you will see how far you are. Overwhelming love becomes overcoming love. Look at Saul. I look at your life and I see where you are with God because of how you treated me and I realize I'm not nearly as close to God as I thought. Thank you, David. He begins to weep. We choose. Are we overcome by evil or do we overcome evil 
with good. Would you bow your heads with me? Listen very, very carefully. Maybe you're here today and um, there is a hurt so deep in your life that you have struggled to let it go. Maybe you've carried it for years. Uh, Maybe it has stunted your spiritual growth. Maybe it has resulted in the death of some things for you. The death of a relationship with a mate. The death of a relationship with your children, with a church. Even God, your relationship with God has suffered because you're so angry. And maybe today you would say, I don't, I don't want to live like that anymore. I, I don't want to be that angry person, that angry mom, that angry dad. I'm, I'm ready to let go of my anger, Pastor. Maybe you need to step out and grab one of our ministers by the hand and say, listen, that's what I want to do today. Or maybe you're here and God has looked down in this life. And I think this is crazy, but he does this stuff. He looks down and he goes, there's someone who needs the love of God. And I choose you to serve them God's love. And you would look back at God and say, serve them God's love. I can't even stand them. Do you understand what they've done to me, God? God said, look at you. Because who better than someone who's been hurt like you? To show them how real God's love really is. Or maybe God would say to you today, it's time to have them over for a meal. It's gone on long enough. It's time to share some bread together. Make this thing right. Dustin's here with me. Matthew's here with me. Would love to pray with you about anything. If you want to put your life at this church, grow here. If you're ready to talk about what it means to follow Jesus, this is your time. Father, thank you so much. God, do what only you can do today. We thank you in advance in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand?